Hello, hello. For those that don't know me, my name is Apollo. I am one of the youth pastors here. I get to do ministry alongside my friend uh, Nathan Kennedy, who's in the back behind the screen right now. Give it for Pastor Nathan. He is uh, the youth pastor of the Brentwood campus, doing a phenomenal job. You're also probably wondering, hey, where's Pastor Ray? You're cool and all, but I miss my pastor. Uh, I miss him too. Ray's one of my closest friends, and uh, he's actually on a trip right now. Does anyone know where he's at? Israel, that's right. He's in Israel right now. He's taking a trip with some of our church family. I think we have a picture of some of our team up on the screens. That's uh, right there in the front, Pastor Ryan's big head. It's the biggest because it's the closest. Uh, but then you see Pastor Ray kind of in the middle to the right. He's got the East San Jose pose. I'm not smiling for no picture. Um, but that's my pastor. That's my friend, uh, Pastor Ray. The trip. They're in Israel right now. It's beautiful. As we're diving into Luke chapter 20, we're also learning about uh, Jesus' ministry around Israel. Uh, one of the most amazing moments of his trip so far, he just uh, sent me this picture this morning. It's uh, him getting baptized in the uh, Jordan River, uh, where Jesus got baptized with uh, Pastor Jason. Um, and just a beautiful moment. I remember going there and just seeing these things that Jesus saw and uh, walking where Jesus walked. And it was a beautiful moment for me. Right now, actually, I got a text from some of our team members. They're currently on the Sea of Galilee right now. And just there's a beautiful sun, uh, sunrise. And uh, God's just doing some amazing things out there. Um, but he's doing some amazing things out here as well. Um, but when I reflect back on moments, like when I went to Israel, uh, I remember just walking where he walked and thinking to myself, how beautiful would it have been if I was like walking side by side with Jesus? Imagine like being next to Jesus when he like raised the little girl from the dead. Imagine being next to Jesus when he like took like bread and fish and like made enough food for 5,000 people. Imagine being next to him when he did those things. And I reflect back on that, how powerful that would have been. But sometimes I think I get spoiled um, because I think of moments like that because Matthew spent time with Jesus, but there was moments when Jesus left Matthew and Matthew didn't have Jesus in that moment. Or moments when he did ministry side by side with Peter and then Jesus would walk away and Peter wouldn't have Jesus. But Jesus, when he went to the cross, he says, hey, I'm going to, when he, when he resurrected, he said, I will send you someone who will help you do even greater things because there's these moments when the disciples had Jesus and they didn't have Jesus. But there's beautiful moments in our life today where God has given us the Holy Spirit, and we have them when we wake up, we have them when we're drinking our coffee, we have them when we're living our life, we have them when we're going to work, when we're at school, every single day of our lives, we have community with God. Isn't that beautiful? Amen? That's absolutely beautiful, but we're hopping in today. Um, I don't want to just dive straight into uh, my chunk of scripture today. I'm speaking out of Luke chapter 20. Uh, If you were here last week, you'll know that Pastor Ray also spoke out of Luke chapter 20. I want to give a real quick recap of some stuff he talked about. So in uh, in chapter 20, the first few verses, verses 1 through 8, this is when some of the religious leaders, uh, some Sadducees, these were kind of the high and mighty, they thought they were better than everybody, they were accusing Jesus. They were calling him out for some stuff. Uh, They were asking, does he really have the authority to do the things he says he's going to do? Is he really powerful enough to do the things that he's set out to accomplish? Is he really who he says he is? And they're asking him these questions and questioning his authority along the way. And every step of the way, Jesus had an answer. Yes, I am. Yes, I do. Yes, I can. The next few verses, Jesus calls them out. 9 through 19, it's the parable of the tenants where Jesus is calling these religious leaders out. And he's saying, you have been disrespectful to Israel. And you've been disrespectful to God. And he continues on. Uh, verses 20 through 26. They're trying to trap him even more. They're saying, hey, we live in this area that's under Roman rule, and we know that we're supposed to pay taxes, but there's some fighting and debating happening, and people are arguing, well, who should I pay taxes? Who should I give my money to? Should I give it to God, or should I give it to Caesar? And you might be familiar with these famous verses, and Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. For those that don't know, it's tax season. Make sure you pay your taxes, (laughs) y'all. Don't get caught up like these Sadducees did. Um, Jesus is saying, pay your taxes. It's a good thing to pay your taxes. He says, but also give to God what is God's. Uh, know and understand that it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him in the first place. And so this is where we're at. They just, we just got done with some of these conversations last week. Pastor Ray walked us through. Um, but they still keep coming. They're still frustrated. They're sending spies to catch him. Uh, they're trying to catch people. and They're trying to catch Jesus in these spaces where he's going to stumble over his words eventually. He's going to get caught eventually. Um, but every step of the way, Jesus has a response. And uh, it kind of reminds me of maybe I'm I'm, I'm a little older, I'm dating myself for for the teenagers that are in the room or some of my youth leaders that are in the room. There's this cartoon I used to watch, uh, this guy named Elmer Fudd. Anyone who Elmer Fudd is? Be very, very quiet. 
And Elmer Fudd was always trying to catch Bugs Bunny, right? And every time he tried, Bugs Bunny always had a way out. And essentially, that's what Jesus is doing. He says, silly Elmer Fudd, you have no clue what's happening. Uh, you have no context of, of what you're trying to trap me in. Um, you keep trying, but I promise you, you'll fail time and time again. And that's what Jesus keeps on doing. Um, but it's important that I share kind of some context of what's leading up to this moment. I asked my students a question this week. I asked, who watches Netflix? And I asked them, who of you watches Netflix for 10 seconds at a time? We don't do that, right? Um, how many of you are like me, and you get this uh, screen that pops up real quick, and it says, are you still watching? And you feel judged, and you think Netflix is trying to catch you slipping? And I'm like, you know what? I'm in season six, episode five of Downtown Abbey. Let me finish in one sitting. Stop judging me. <laughs> that was a really loud laugh. Thank you so much, Daphne. One person thinks I'm funny. Um, <laughs> it's not about you, Gloria. Um, so that was an inside joke. Sorry. So I feel like I need to explain now, otherwise I sound like a jerk. So Daphne is one of our worship leaders. She was leading worship today. And uh, during Christmas time, we sang the song, Glo you know what I'm talking about? Gloria, right? And she, she goes, if you're, if you're in here today and your name's Gloria, it's not about you, Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> And I just made fun of her for the better part of a year, and her husband joined along. And so it's not about you. If your name, if your name is Gloria in here, I'm sorry. I promise. We love you. But still, it's not about you, Gloria. It's about Jesus. Um, but they kept trying to catch him. Um, and it's important, again, that we read context of Scripture. We don't just look at this one singular verse. Memory verses are beautiful. Hide that word in your heart that you might not sin against, and that's beautiful. Um, but don't just read one verse at a time. Don't just read a few seconds at a time. It's important that we look at the entire chapter, look at the entire book, look at the entire Bible, because it's all interwoven and interconnected, and something that happened in the Old Testament still connects us back to Jesus in the New. Something that happened in Matthew chapter 1 connects us to Matthew chapter 20. We serve a good God that interweaves himself in and out of Scripture. Amen? Amen. So please don't ever just read one moment at a time. Watch the whole thing. Read the whole thing. But here we are, in, still in chapter 20, a uh, later part of the, of the chapter, verses 27 and on. And in this moment, uh, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, the elite, they're trying to catch Jesus. Um, in this moment, the topic of debate is the resurrection. And I'm not just talking about Jesus rising from the dead, um, because there's moments in Scripture, both in the Old and New Testaments, in First and Second Kings, we see both Elijah and Elisha raise people from the dead. We see Jesus in Scripture raises Lazarus from the dead. And we're not even talking about when Jesus will eventually raise himself in the resurrection. I'm talking about the ultimate resurrection. For those that don't know, um, uh, this is essentially what N.C. Wright calls the resurrection is life after, life after death. So not even just heaven, what happens after heaven? What then? Right? And that's what's happening. But this is that, that, that area of theology is one that I cannot, I cannot communicate to you in a 20-minute message. Um, so I want to encourage you, if you're not listening to our podcast, we have some podcasts called The Deeper Podcast, where uh, Pastor Ryan will dive deeper into topics like this. Um, or if you have questions, big questions on theology or questions about the resurrection, shoot an email to ryan at the church because he knows 10 times, 10 million times more than I do. Um, if you didn't, he's actually on the Israel trip as the tour guide. That's how much he knows. So hit up Ryan at the bay.church, uh, phenomenal man of God. Um, but that's what they're talking about. They're talking about resurrection. They're talking about life after, life after death. What happens, right? And they're trying to catch him. Um, and what's crazy is the Sadducees, the people who are trying to catch him, they don't even believe in the resurrection. But they're still trying to catch him. So let's dive in right here, Luke chapter 20, verses 27, the first few up to verse 33. And it says this in verse 27. Some of the Sadducees, these were again the religious elites, it says they say there is no resurrection, who say there's no resurrection, they came to Jesus with a question. They said, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise the offspring of his brother. Quick context. Uh, what would happen sometimes in, in this culture is a husband and wife would get married, and if the husband died, in that culture, in that time, typically only the man worked in that culture. And so if he passed away, this woman would be left without any source of income and would live an entire life of poverty, sometimes lead to an early death because she couldn't even buy her basic essentials. And so in this culture, they were really much family-driven and community-oriented. So if a husband and wife were married and the husband died, oftentimes the husband's brother would step in and help uh, take care of that woman or take care of the family. And so now, there's, now they're creating these kind of rhetorical situations and saying, Jesus, if this happened, 
who is her actual husband? And let's read. And it says this. Uh, now there were seven brothers. This is them trying to chat. This is them making up the scenario. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. This is what I talked about. The second, and then the third, and then the, and they kept on marrying, and every single time one would pass away, the next one would marry. So first brother died, second brother died, and they just kept on remarrying this woman to take care of her. Again, this is a rhetorical situation. Then it says in verse 32, finally, the woman died too. Now then at the resurrection, they ask him, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? I'm hunting wabbits. They're getting this spot where they're trying to catch him slipping. And they're saying, hey, like, whose wife is she really? We're in the resurrection. Someday they're going to stand face to face. Who is going where, right? Who belongs with whom? Who is married to whom? And they're trying to catch him. And Jesus gives them a response. And it isn't the response they're looking for. And it's a response that as I read scripture, it kind of makes me feel a certain way. I feel kind of convicted. And I realize maybe my priorities are a little bit off. But Jesus responds and essentially tells them, hey, you're asking the wrong questions. Because honestly... When the resurrection comes, it's not going to really matter. And he says this, Luke uh, chapter 20, verses 34 and on, it says, Jesus replied, he said, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in, in resurrection. Essentially, after the resurrection, there's no weddings, there's no wedding parties. He says these things in resurrection become obsolete. And he's saying, and they no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. And what Jesus is saying here to me is so profound, because they're asking about marriage here, and they're asking about, about marriage in the future. And what Jesus is saying is, he's not, he's not downplaying marriage. Jesus acknowledges all throughout Scripture the importance of marriage. He even considers our relationship with him similar to a marriage. He's not downplaying marriage, but what he's saying is, what you think is important is not the most important. What you think is the most beautiful thing in the world, for Jesus is saying, as beautiful as it is, it's not the most beautiful. It's funny, last service, I, I, was, I was sharing this as my wife walked in through the doors, and everyone just turned around and looked at her. My wife's kind of introverted, and everyone started clapping for her. She's like, oh my gosh, no, and she tried to escape. But as beautiful as my wife is, as amazing as my kids are, <laughs> as beautiful as that relationship is, Jesus is still saying, that's not the most important thing. And for me, who loves my wife deeply, who that, who that is the most, rela most important relationship I have on this earth, Jesus is saying, as beautiful as that is, it's not the most important thing. And I have to ask myself and reflect on my own life, what in my life have I made to be the most important thing? But Jesus looks at it and says, hey, that's beautiful, that's important, but that's not the most important thing. And so I, I throw back this question to you. In your life, what matters most? In your life, what matters most? That's a question I want you to ask yourself. And to put that on the screen, I want you to really think about that. In your life, not beyond your relationship with your spouse, beyond your relationship with your kids, ask yourself, what are the most important things in my life? And as you ask yourself that question, ask yourself this follow-up question. What is the most important thing to Jesus? Not just what's important to Jesus, but what's the most important thing to Jesus? And it's important that we ask ourselves that question because I can't tell you how many times in my life I've actually gotten that question wrong. In our life, there's things that matter, but Jesus is saying sometimes there's things that matter more. Because after the resurrection, what he's saying here is nothing matters more. No relationship matters more than your relationship with me. He just says your house, your car, your paycheck won't matter anymore. Your body eventually won't matter anymore. The last name you have won't matter anymore. The family line you're trying to carry on, he's saying all these things won't matter anymore. Because through the resurrection, you're stepping into a new life where death doesn't even matter anymore. And how beautiful is that, that Jesus himself, in moments when his disciples had their eyes fixed on Jesus' death, he says, I'm going to leave you. His eyes weren't even fixed on that because he knew that a resurrection was around the corner. In our life, ask yourself, what things am I attaching my eyes, my heart, and my attention to? What has become the most important thing to me and what is the most important thing to Jesus? 
Jesus continues on in Luke chapter 20, verses 37 through 40. He continues on, and it says this. Uh, Jesus is now giving them some authority from the word of God. And he says, in the second account, or I'm sorry, but in the account of the burning bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise. For he calls the Lord, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For to him all are alive. Some of the teachers of the law responded, well said, teacher, and no one dared ask him any more questions. So what Jesus is doing here is he's actually setting some groundwork. He's saying, hey, like I know because you're trying to catch me because you don't believe in me. Let me show you who your heroes are, the Abrahams, the Moseses, the, Abra- the Isaacs. These people are people you respect and revere, and even they understand that we serve the God of the living, not just the God of the dead. And again, they keep fixing their eyes back on what they think is most important. And he says, even your heroes of the faith understand the power of our God, the power of our living God who can raise the dead to life. And he continues on the next few verses, verse 41. It says, then Jesus said to them, why is it said that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself declares in the book of Psalms, he says this, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. What we see here is David calls him Lord. David, in this Psalm 110, is speaking about Jesus in the future. And what he's saying is everyone's eyes are fixed on the Messiah coming from the line of David, being one of David's sons. And what Jesus is saying here is you, all you care about is him being one of David's sons. But we look at David's response, and David is calling him Lord. Even David isn't fixated on this. He's saying what actually really matters is Jesus. What actually really matters is my God. And I ask myself again, in my life, what have I made more important than Jesus? What have I made more important than God? And he continues on. Verse 45. While all the people were listening, Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted and respected in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and places of honor and banquets. But it says they devour widows' houses for this, and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished severely. And what he's saying is even these religious leaders, it says they have their long flowing robes. They're going out into the marketplace. They want to be respected. And so not only is um, he saying don't focus on the difficult parts of your life, don't only focus on like the death and the hurt, but he's saying also don't focus on these flashy things. Don't focus on what you think matters. Um, Jesus, there's even a moment in scripture where there's these people who did miracles in Jesus's name and they called out to Jesus, did we not do miracles? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not heal the blind and heal the sick? And Jesus says, depart from me because I never knew you. You were doing things that sounded good, You were doing things and you were even using my name, but Jesus says you never operated out of this place of love because in your life, everything should should flow from this place of relationship and love with me. Because if anything else takes my place, if anything takes my place, you're focusing on the wrong thing. And he continues on, and Jesus gives a beautiful example. This is now in Luke chapter 21. We are now in the next chapter. If you didn't know, chapters were actually man-made. Sometimes in scripture, an author would write, and we, uh, or or there was a group of people, the Council of Nicaea, who they they broke up verses, they broke up uh, the books of the Bible into chapters. They said this makes the most sense flow-wise, but sometimes it would be one train of thought. So Luke chapter 20 ends, Luke 21 begins, and this is what uh, Jesus continues to say is most important. And it says, Jesus looked up, and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury, and he also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. And Jesus said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of the others, and all these people give their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. And we see again, time after time, these religious leaders, they think what's most important is that I'm giving out of what I have, my abundance. They're giving out of their riches. They're putting in more money than she is. But Jesus is pointing at her and saying, but look at what she's done. What she is doing is absolutely beautiful. What she is doing is absolutely beautiful. She's not giving out of her abundance. She's giving out of God's. She's not giving out of what she has. She's giving out of what God has given her. And there's this beautiful moment in this connect where Jesus Jesus says, this is what matters most. See, these religious leaders, they're using the wrong scoreboard. 
They're using the wrong set of rules. I, I used to think I was really good at golf. Um, and then I realized that my high score was actually a bad thing. Um, and I realized I was using the wrong scoreboard. What I thought was important, right? Like, how many times can I hit it, right? That's, that's what I need to, to show that I'm good. I was wrong. I was using the wrong scoreboard. Um, I used to play football in high school, and then I transitioned later. I started playing basketball because my knees couldn't take football anymore. Uh, but I, sometimes I would still use the same rules of football, and I was measuring my success on the basketball court by how many tackles I got. And I realized, again, I was playing by the wrong rules. And that's essentially what's happening here. These, sad, these religious leaders, they're saying, hey, this is what matters most. This is what the most important thing is. Put your eyes right here on the things that matter. And Jesus is saying, you are wrong. You're using the wrong rules, the wrong scoreboard. You're playing the wrong sport. You're looking at it the wrong way. Let me give you some perspective. So I want to show you a table real quick about the things that these religious leaders thought was the most important thing and what Jesus showed them actually was. So the first thing, they expected a warrior on a horse, but what they got was a servant on a donkey. They were expecting this valiant king to come crashing down, but they saw a servant coming as a donkey. The next thing that they expected, they expected him, we just talked about this, to be from the line of David, to be one of David's sons, but they, they, they saw even in scripture itself that David called him Lord. Next one. They came in their long robes and public showmanship to say, hey, look at what I've done, look at what I've accomplished, look at what I have, and Jesus was looking for humility. The next thing that they expected was a crown of jewels, but they got a crown of thorns. Uh, they thought he would have everything that was possible. They thought he would show them a beautiful way to live in, in riches of his glory, and they thought it actually meant riches, but he came in a crown of thorns not to show what he had, but what he did for them. And the last one is uh, they thought that they should be giving out of their personal abundance, but he showed them to give from God's abundance. And time and time again, they said, this is what's most important. And time and time again, Jesus said, but this is what's most important. And I can't tell you how many times I have read this scripture and I have judged these religious leaders, but I have been guilty of the same exact thing where I have said, Jesus, I think this is what matters most. I think this is what's most important, but I get it wrong over and over and over again. Because see, when we approach our life with this mentality of the resurrection, saying, hey, like death, death sucked. The disciples, they saw what Jesus was doing, and they said, Jesus, you're going to go to the cross. You're going to die, Jesus? And they were fixed on Jesus going to the cross and dying, and they were so stuck in that. And Jesus is saying, you got it wrong. I need to die. Because without death, there's no resurrection. But all they're doing is pointing at the death. I can't tell you how many times in my life all I pointed to was the death in my life. All I pointed to was the hurt in my life. All I pointed to was the pain and the situations of my life. And I kept pointing and saying, God, look at this. This sucks. This hurts. This is painful. I feel broken. I feel beat down. I feel hopeless. And that's all I focused on. And Jesus has said, but watch this. In all my situations of my life, I pointed at something and Jesus says, but watch. I pointed at this hurt and Jesus says, but watch this. I can't tell you how many times I pointed at my problems and said, watch my problems when, when all I really, didn't do, really needed to do was watch Jesus. And I want you to know that Jesus doesn't discredit your pain or your hurt. When I was going through the loss of my father, I pointed at that and Jesus took me through a years long journey of healing. For some of you in this room, maybe you've gone through hurt and you've gone through pain. Jesus understands. He gets it. When one of his close friends, Lazarus, died, there's scripture, two-word scripture, says Jesus wept. Scripture teaches us there's a time to, uh, to mourn. There's a time to weep. But let, not, let us not fix our attention and our focus there. And I realize in my life, sometimes what I think is the problem is not the problem. Sometimes it's my proximity to that problem how close I am to that problem. See, because when I look at my problem and I look at how big it is, I get stuck on how big it is. My problem is insurmountable. My problem is filling me with fear. My problem is filling me with doubt. And I'm so close to my problem and I see how big my problem is and I'm so close to my problem. If I would change my proximity to my problem and bring my proximity to Jesus, I would realize that he is bigger than my problem, that he is bigger than my hurt, amen? That he is bigger than my situations. He is bigger than what I'm going through. He is bigger than everything I've pointed and saying this is 
all I can think about, my problem and my pains and my hurt and my trouble and my heartache and all the things I'm going through, they're so huge. But if we would take a step back and look at the hugeness of our God, maybe we would see some modern day miracles. If we would take a step away from our situations and our problems, say, man, those problems are so big. And say, I understand those problems are big, but we also serve a God who's bigger. There's other times in my life where I point at my success and say, man, I can't believe I've done this. I can't believe I've got this far. Maybe for some of you, there's been some success you found in the workplace. Uh, maybe you found success financially. Maybe you found success relationally. Um, and sometimes we say, hey, look how far I've come. Look how big. Look at all these things I've done. And Jesus says, step away from your success for a little bit and look at me. And look how much further I could take you. Look at the places I could bring you. Look at the influence I can give you. Step away from your problems for a moment and get close to Jesus. Step away from your success for a moment and look at Jesus. Because too many times in my life, I have made both my problem and my success bigger than him. What Jesus is saying all throughout this scripture is, I know you think this matters. And I'm not discrediting you. Your relationship with your wife is beautiful. Love her and love her well. Your relationship with your kids is amazing. Love them and love them well. Your relationships with the people around you are beautiful. Love these people and love them well. But if you don't have love in your heart for me, if you don't have a close, a, if you don't have proximity and nearness to Jesus, then honestly, at the end of the day, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. So I want to take a moment with you today to ask yourself that question. Keep asking yourself that question. In my life, what have I made the most important thing? Even good and beautiful things, what things have taken the top of your life? What things are sitting on your throne? My heart, my prayer today is that we would not just say Jesus is Savior, we would say He is Lord, that He has dominion over my problems, and I give Him all my success. I want to ask you in this room, what are some things, what are some relationships, what are some accolades, and what are some problems you have faced that have become bigger than your Jesus? This whole series we're in, this whole showdown is Jesus pointing at the bigger picture. Even the disciples got caught up in the death of Jesus. So many times I get caught up and stumbling blocks, I get caught up in hurt, I get caught up in my issues and my problems. It all just take a step back and say, Jesus, you are bigger than these things. How different will my life look? If every success, every act, everything I've accomplished in life, if I would just point back to Jesus, how different will my life look? If I truly live my life with this understanding and mentality that the resurrection is real, that yes, Jesus dies, but he rises again. That yes, my problems are difficult. But yes, my God is a God of healing, a God of restoration, a God of hope, a God of peace, a God of joy, a God that can take all of my situations and make them whole again. So I want to pray with every person in this room today. Father, I, I know I am not alone. I know even in your word, there's a moment when you were about to go to the cross and you said, you said, Father, if possible, let this cup pass from me. Even you were terrified of the cross, but you knew it had to be done. Father, you were beaten, you were betrayed, you were broken. There was moments where you could have felt hopeless. And in that, Father, you can relate to every person in this room who's felt broken, who's felt hopeless, who's felt beaten down. I pray you remind them, God, that yes, there's death, but there's resurrection. Yes, there's mourning, but there's also hope. So, Father, for every person in this room that's felt separated from you, who's been close to their problems, I pray they would change their proximity and be close to you. So with every eye closed, with every eye closed in this room, if you're in here and you're saying, you know what, I have made my problems and my or my success bigger than my Jesus, 
If you're here and you're saying, you know what, Pastor Paulo, I need to put him back on the throne of my life where he belongs. I need to put God as the number one priority in my life and everything in my life should flow from that. My love for people would flow from that. My love for my family would flow from that. My love for my coworkers, my love for my community would flow out of this place of love that I have for you. If you're in here and you're saying, I need Jesus back at the top of my life, I need to reprioritize and put him at the center. If that's you with every eye closed, could you just raise your hand for me so I know to be praying for you? Thank you. Thank you. God, I pray for every hand that just went up and for every other person in this room who's also felt the same, that maybe you haven't been the number one in their life. Maybe they've been a close number two, but you're saying you want to be at the top of our life, God, to love us, to hold us, to take care of us, to walk us through our hurts and pains, but also to walk us into our success and our future. God, you are beautiful and we love you and we trust you. We're praying for more of you and less of us. I pray we would no longer have proximity issues, God, but we would look at you as the ruler of our life. Let every part of our lives flow from that love, God. We love you and pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen.